I just want to start off again by, I know uh, Kevin welcomed everyone and uh, referred to who everyone is. So we do have the, the, the moving slide behind who, I'm uh, sorry, the large one behind us, as you tell who everyone is. So just in the interest of time, we just want to welcome you all again and thank you for coming. Um, I want to be careful as well that, sorry, Patrick, based on your talk that I just don't ask all the questions that I want to ask, that I can try and do something that fits for the wider university, but I'm going to let you draw a breath and get your water. And I was particularly taken with your, your, your pillar five and how, I suppose, it's a multidisciplinary systemic approach to how we take on to, to address these challenges. And I suppose the question for everyone then is the how do we envisage that intersection between academic research, policy from governments, practical implementation, um, but it, as you referred to a few times, the context of the region's climate action plan and bioeconomy strategies. And I might start off, if I will, with Lalitha, if that's okay, because I think in many ways, I think your experience speaks to many of those things, because I know, oh, sorry, I should have said there's going to be a bit of sharing of microphones here between every two because uh, just on the, on the feed system that we have for the microphones. Uh, thanks for spotting that. But yeah, sorry, Lalitha, that Saligness that you're with, um, I suppose you did grow out of a research lab essentially, um, but an expertise now that feeds both into the regional requirements, national and indeed international, and has been involved in the bioeconomy for so long. So if that's have moved on too far, far, far from my original question. Yeah, that intersection, I suppose, of all of those, please. Yeah, thanks. Good morning, everyone. So, as as it was mentioned before, in you know, in, in the two talks by Kevin and also by Patrick, universities are the source of knowledge. Excel Ignaces has spun out from UL, from uh, Dan Hayes PhD, and at that time. Um, the policy is also very important because at that time, it was considered that the bioeconomy will grow massively. There will be hundreds of biorefineries in this world. And Seligness can offer analysis services all well and good. And it was the policy during that time. And the policy changes. And as the policy change, the the institutes and the companies, especially the startups and also the large companies, we have to adapt according to the policy. And it was a slow growth for some time for Seligness, but then because of EU funds and the policy changes in the EU, um, especially the Horizon 2020 funds, we could grow quite efficiently and you know and we collaborate with University Limerick quite well we work with JJ very close and we work with Morris Collins so we work with University Limerick and our dream I mean at least for Seligness we look at the resources available nationally to give an example if in Ireland if we use green waste to produce certain type of polymers and if just with one polymer in it it's a 40 million euro revenue. So these, the potential is massive. We have resources here and a lot of companies, we want to work with universities and definitely the EU policy is really good um, in this way, improving the bioeconomy. And nationally, I think we have to do a bit more and regionally as well. So, Thank you. So. And um, sorry, Brian, I don't mean to... Look, I'm skipping you, but I just on, I want to draw on from what Lita was saying there. And I suppose going back to the, the pillar and the community idea, um, I suppose a lot of that is the university and industry sector. So I just want to jump across to Laura Jane here because I think maybe the experience is maybe you could share something of the Loop Head initiative because, you know, it, stakeholders in the community have to come on board as well. And maybe you could maybe share some insights of is there a difficulty or a challenge maybe in getting people moving from their traditional maybe agricultural model to growing a new crop, but also the, the very real stewardship and monitoring of the land that you were involved with? Okay, uh, so I suppose how we got into this position was we started a company back in 2018, Growing Hemp. And um, our product is, is basically um, a cannabinoid rich oil. And we only use a very small amount of hemp when we're making our products, so we're, we're left with 
and, and an amount of protein and an amount of carbon rich material. So we were looking at this huge resource and saying, how can we, how can we include this in the bioeconomy? How can we engage with this? But we also, at the same time, our local community group came to us and said, have you any ideas around a project related to soil health or a community project in soil health? So at that stage, we engaged our community and said, OK, we have this potential idea where we can um, use hemp as a crop, but to produce something like biochar, um, which is a real carbon intensive product, which is inert and um, and use our natural like production of slurry as a kind of a microbial tea. And we brought that to as, as a natural fertilizer. So we were regenerative farming. So what we really wanted to say to our, farm, our farming community is well, actually you could potentially move away from using artificial fertilizers. And this is a way to do it. And the time we brought it to our community, the price of fertilizer was very, very high. So what we were doing was we were offering a solution um, that could reduce the, the, you know, the inputs that they were putting into the soil. And I think why we were so successful in our project is because we engaged the community at the very start as a partner. So they have been a partner in the project and they were funded as part of the project. And then the research came after. So it was really about the researchers going to the community, speaking to the community about their problem, their issues, bringing them on as partners and ensuring then that they came along at every stage. And I think what I was, I suppose the point of what I'm trying to say here is it kind of engaged with what Patrick was saying earlier. Civil society is a really important stakeholder in the project. But from a research point of view, I think often that stakeholder doesn't get brought on as a partner in the sense of a funded partner, an equal partner in European projects. So I think it's a great to engage with the community, but it's more important to have them at equal standing and I think that's why Hemp for Soil ultimately um, was a successful project. Great. That's great, thanks. Just to carry on from the, I suppose, the community and, and the social side maybe, but going back into policy, again, if we can go to you now, Kieran, on the, um, that interaction again of the, of the different strands and your experience with, I suppose, Limerick City, first and foremost. Yeah. First and foremost, I'm a town planner, I'm not an engineer, I'm not a scientist. Uh, and my experience to date has been in the area of, of energy and the energy transition as part of a Horizon 2020 project called Positive City Exchange, uh, in which UL is one of our partners in it. And one of our key uh, outputs from that was the creation of a citizen innovation lab in Limerick City Centre, in the UL City Centre campus, uh, which is trying to create an ecosystem that puts the citizen at the centre and driving citizen-led innovation, bringing together then uh, all the other members of the, the quintuple helix, academia, funders, government. Uh, but our solutions have got to address citizen needs. So over the course of the last number of years, we've run various campaigns around where citizens have, have championed uh, certain processes. So simple things like to transition to buying an EV car. We got citizens to tell us actually, what are your challenges? How easy was it to get your car charger? How did you pick your, pick your car, your range anxiety? And their stories, we hope, are informing our policymakers. And so we did that on, on EV charging. We have supported uh, disadvantaged communities to become sustainable energy communities. And they operate at their own levels. So one community, their introduction to it was light bulb exchanges. Bring in your old light bulbs, get an LED light, light bulb, and that starts their journey. And you gotta, you gotta pitch things at the level of the community and you build out from that. Uh, the local authority is there to facilitate, encourage, support. We bring certain funding streams that we can get from Europe. We also want to bring academia with us. We want to bring as many people together and uh, small-scale funding initiatives, small initiatives the whole time is what, what's doing it, while continually looking at the bigger picture. Thanks very much. I, I think what you refer to there, or sorry, I'm not saying you refer to, but it brings to mind what Laura Jane just said there as well, as thinking the equal partner in, in the listening to what the community or the citizen needs. Um, I don't know, have you recovered yet, Patrick, from your talk? You're ready to, ready to jump in and maybe just maybe expand uh, again on that, on what 
role uh, in the intersection we can get between institutes such as ourselves, policy coming from be it Europe or Dublin, and that practical implementation. Yeah, thanks, Ronan. Um, so I think I think there's very well known structured steps about how you can deploy a bioeconomy. Um, we were involved in writing a report uh, for the EU to advise uh, all member states. So 19 member states came together and we came up with a 10 step plan. So you start off with uh, envisioning and envisioning comes from knowledge and practice on the ground and combining uh, uh, knowledge from places like academic institutions with, with people who are working in loop head and putting that together and saying, this is what can be done. And then you kind of organize, you take a structured approach where the university and the key, key leaders there need to uh, work together on this vision with a range of stakeholders, the county councils, as we were assessing, the, the, the local political leaders, the industries, uh, uh, and, 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 the, and the key citizens, because citizens, citizens have to understand what a bioeconomy means, they're participating in it, they're active buyers of products, they have choices, uh, but we, we, also, we, we also need to help them to make the right choices. So you take that, you take that structured approach and then you need to mobilize, so you, you come up with a plan. So what are the things you're gonna do in the short term? You're gonna work with your local farmers to uh, use bio-based fertilizers instead of uh, chemical fertilizers. Where are they gonna be sourced from? So th it's a lot of work to, to do that. There's gonna be medium term actions where science and technology and innovation needs to be scaled up and I'm, we're not quite sure what it'd look like within the ground, on the ground and there needs to work with industry to develop those ideas. And then you have to have big, long-term thinking. So how are you going to decarbonize Limerick City? How, is, how are you going to build buildings with timber or with materials that are uh, less energy intensive? So that takes long-term planning and thinking. You work in that sort of manner, then you just get activities going on the ground. You see what's working and what's working and not, what's not working, and you try to find solutions for those. It's very practical stuff. And then you try to measure how you're progressing. And you've, you find key measurements like amount of timber used in buildings in Limerick City or amount of fertilizer that's bio-based that's used on the ground or that's nature-based. You know, you'd use clover instead. So you, it doesn't always be a bio-based solution, but it's basically a solution more, to, towards more sustainable, uh, economically beneficial system. So you, you measure it. So it's very practical things that you can do, but it needs to be done locally. And that's the point because the resources that, that, you, can, uh, that you can harvest from the ground in Limerick Clare and Tipperary, they're all different, different soils, different geographies. So you need to think locally uh, and develop that out. So that, that's what we said, practical steps. Excellent, thanks very much. And I suppose, um, to come to you now, Brian, as well, I suppose that's one thing you probably have a lot of is listening to citizen needs. And I know you've been a, a regular visitor to us here in UL as well. So um, how can you see that policy linkage with what citizens are looking for their needs and how we can deliver with academic research to lead to practical imp implementation. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, and thank you for the invitation to uh, to attend this morning and uh, Ray particularly who reached out. Um, and I haven't had the benefit of Patrick's talk and uh, just li from listening to Patrick there, um, it was quite stimulated and uh, I, I really love to have a, a longer engagement actually because I think it would be quite useful. Um, my experience of the last few years, by the way, I'm not a town planner, but I am an engineer, and uh, or at least I was, and now I'm a politician, and um, uh, I've, I probably forget most of what I learned uh, in engineering, so uh, it's good to be back and uh, to be stimulated in this way uh, again after a few years being out of it. Um, my experience of the last few years, uh, particularly in my role as chair of the Joint Directors Committee on Environment and Climate Action is that when you engage with a subject and you get lay people like politicians to engage with a subject, uh, they, they can really get it, you know, they can really get into it if they're interested uh, and uh, they, they find the gaps in, in our knowledge, they, they figure out what needs to be done uh, and, and you know, and if they're interested, they'll apply themselves, and that's how we make progress. You know, and they'll they'll push colleagues in their political parties and ministers and so on. Uh, but what I found is that 
quite often the conversations that need to be happening aren't happening. So I chair that committee and week in, week out, it's just incredible the, the, the discussion that happens uh, about all aspects of climate and environment policy. But then you go outside the committee room and you speak with colleagues uh, who aren't members of that committee and they're just, there's a chasm in understanding, you know. And so we have to figure out a way, like, you know, we, we kind of pat ourselves on the back and say, we're doing great work. Um, you know, these discussions are fantastic. And then we read uh, the the newspaper article about the, the, the three or four hour discussions that we've had and it like picks up on the sensational aspect of the meeting that really isn't the thing that the people need to hear about. Um, and then the colleagues across the Oireachtas, they pick up on that and we just find that the interesting discussion is is hitting a brick wall. And I think that's a real problem. Um, penny drop for me a couple of years ago, I was in the, the doll bar, I shouldn't admit to that, but um, one of the very anti-green, anti-environment politicians was walking around looking at his phone and looking at uh, how much uh, electricity his solar panels were generating at home. And he was going, this is fantastic. I'm making so much money, you know? And this guy is someone who wasn't or didn't think he was bought into uh, the what this big reform that we're, we're trying to uh, bring about but he was un unknowingly he was you know and it just occurred to me that if we can make policy really relevant uh, to the everyday person and including the politicians um, then you'll start to see the changes and I've, I've, I've just seen that in in my role in the last few years and going on visits uh, to uh, various sites or, or parts of the country or to events and when you know the main policy leader i.e the minister's uh, eyes are opened to something that uh, is going that is happening on the ground it just can lead if, if he or she agrees with uh, what's happening that they go into work the next morning and say we need to do more of that uh, and I've seen <laughs> huge decisions happen in that way. So there's, at the moment, I think there's, um, uh, you know, there, there's this kind of wall between the people who are really interested and really active and understand these issues uh, and the people who set the policy uh, and, of course, provide funding for, you know, to underpin the policy as well. Uh, so I think if we can bridge that, I think it's it, I, to acknowledge that that's the uh, the challenge. I think is a good first step. Awesome, thanks. Um, to just go back to, I suppose we're in the University of Limerick here on the Burnow, um, and Patrick, you referred to um, you know the success stories in UCC. Uh, you're working with Galway, and we can look to Europe for uh, places like the Fraunhofer. Um, I'm going to jump to Lalitha again. It's just I suppose. What potential are you seeing for and opportunities and how do you go about collaborating with the likes of ourselves to drive forward a bioeconomy initiative? And I suppose within that, what are some of your challenges? Yeah, um, I think when it comes to the research part, the collaboration is easy because it's, it's research and development, it's creating um, new innovation. Um, but then beyond that point, when we have to demonstrate it, or when we have to take it to a commercial scale, we see multiple challenges. First is resources. Yes, there are plenty of resources, but we talked quite significantly about policy. And now policy plays a key role when we have to take it from research to demonstration. And there comes, yes, when we do the mapping, there are 100,000 tons available, but is it really available? Does pol current policy allow us to, to have it, you know, to capture that resource? And that's where there are challenges. And, and of course, um, there are general financial risks and you know, the capital investment, all of it. But even before we go there, um, I would say the supply chain, the resources availability, and the, and the policy around it. 
So um, in one of the projects, uh, we are actually, um, uh, Morris Collins is our collaborator, it's Bioneer. It's the innovation action we got this year. We designed it in a way that we go from feedstock to final product here in Limerick. There are 13 partners, but we made sure that one full value chain happens here in Limerick. And when we design the projects, no matter if it's Horizon 2020 or whatever, if we, uh, this, if, if we are co-coordinating or coordinating, not just Seligness, I mean in general when we are collaborating, if we think in that approach, can we, in this collaboration, can we create the whole value chain in a region? It doesn't have to be a city here. We are, we are quite lucky because we are you know, very close to UL, so we could do that. Maybe that's not possible in everyone's case. In that case, at least do, seeing the full value chain regionally, locally is important, even when we are in Horizon 20 EU level projects. Um, and, then, and then comes, if we can talk to the, the local, you know, the Limerick County Council team and, and the regional people and like Patrick Barrett and so on, to see now how can we take the next step? Is there anything in the, in the funding or within the policy that we can take advantage of? So that's where th the second point is where I think collaborations are happening, but it's the, it's the next step is where we are facing the challenges. So yeah, I think no matter wherever you, you know, in how many partners, how big the project is, look at the local value chain and it's quite possible, yeah. Excellent, thanks. Uh, and following on from that, I suppose jumping to, uh, over to Laura Jane now, I suppose if your experiences from the European project in Loophead and as I mentioned already working with the different stakeholders and such, if you were to repeat that I won't say in a different region, we're going to keep you here, but in a, in a different context or different setting slightly, um, or extend that project, how could you see an institution such, such as ourselves, um, how do you reach out to us? Um, how do you see what we can offer and engage? And I know you've worked with other institutions too, so you can use them too, but it, it's how do you get that initial, I suppose, conversation going with um, the institutional partner to drive on, maybe just with the, the hard science or the research element of it? Uh, I suppose, I, I kind of wanted to go back a little bit to what Leticia was saying as well, but um, I suppose I came from a research background. So I came out of LIT, now TUS, and I had great connections with researchers, and I, I love to listen to what people are working on. So um, I could kind of connect into that uh, network easily, but I find for communities that isn't necessarily the case. They really aren't, you know, a fay with research and how research is done and how grant applications are made. So I kind of became a connector for our community into this massive network. And it's actually been very beneficial because we've just, we're now a partner on an EU mission, soil mission, uh, which is gonna be setting up a living lab in as Lupid as the living lab at the lighthouse like farms. And that's bringing the farmers into a situation where they're a social partner. Um, they're as important as research and you know, and are as important as um, government and funding. They've been brought in to, you know, because as, as what has been said, they're like the value chains are very, very expensive to, to or the, the biomass is very, very expensive to, to, to be moving around in large amounts. So to have a value chain that's local, where let's say for Loophead, what we were looking at is we have a huge amount, we have a huge amount of dairy farms. So we have a huge amount of slurry, but we have a huge amount of land. So we have all these kind of, um, we have all these uh, assets at our own, um, uh, to, that we can use within our community to become, make us a, a, let's say, carbon zero community. We were kind of trying to say, what can we do with what we have and then, that was where research came in because we all came with ideas and there was lots and lots of ideas put forward. And what research was able to do is was able to say that will work, that won't work. And kind of direct us towards the, where the, when it, things did work, direct us to where the right funding would come from. So I suppose that's how we engaged. And I think that's another kind of 
request to researchers is there is lots of these communities, you know, there's, that have come together. Um, I think like Ballyhowra and like in around Limerick, there would be, you know, groups of farmers that are very, very interested in the bioeconomy. And it's just by engaging with them and then kind of working with them on a kind of, a, as I said, a partner level. That's how that research will get done. Great, thanks. And I know, Brian, uh, sorry, Kieran, you've already spoken of, of the living labs and you are, you've already got some collaborations going on with University of Limerick. But again, what, maybe what more can we do or what kind of things can institutions offer to, to share that research? But something else that's coming through in the conversations just there from Lalitha and Brian and Laura Jane, I think you've all, I think said the same kind of thing, but maybe a bit differently, is I think the importance of listening to the citizen or the stakeholder and the equal partner. So I suppose as part of my question, uh, rather than just sort of sitting here saying we want to collaborate or, or lead research, is part of it we need to listen as well, or is it just that we offer the research? No, I think you got to listen, but you also got to tell let people know what's going on. So I was fascinated today when I was chatting to Ray and finding out what's going on here, and equally he was fascinated by the stuff that we're doing in Limerick, what we have been doing, and the idea was got to find ways of bringing this together. Uh, the phrase we developed in Positive City Exchange was positive cycles of collaboration. Every time you, you speak to a community, you work with them, you got to give them something, some bit of positivity. It may be just be information, it may be funding, it may be a link to experts. So we've got to try and bring that together. And local authorities are great to be that, that broker. And we have a massive amount of knowledge about our county. We have a massive amount of data. I was chatting to someone in School of Business last week and I said, we've just done a, a hedgerow survey. We're doing a tree plan. We've got a biodiversity plan for, for Limerick. You know, we've got a lot of information here that's available for people to utilize if people will come to us. We also can access funding and we give funding. So uh, thanks to the government, we have the Community Climate Action Fund where communities are now presenting proposals for their own localized climate action. And some of those are about rewilding and biodiversity, they're not all about solar panels and community centers. There's great opportunities there for academia to go into those communities and accelerate their processes to say actually, okay, you've done this in the first instance, so you're collecting food waste for compost, but actually you can bring that another stage further. But the first stage actually, they just wanna collect the food waste. They want to strip it down, create compost, but you can add value to it. Academia can add value to those processes and we need to start sharing this information. So this idea of town and gown being much, much closer together has to be essential. Uh, our climate action team, there's five of us for the whole county trying to drive carbon neutrality by 2050. Okay, the whole organization is bought into it, but it'd be great to have the other supports of academia coming into us. The public participation networks, which is the network of community groups in every county are there to be tapped in. They are a sponge looking for information and they're equally has got a lot of knowledge, a lot of ideas about what they want to do and they just need a bit of help and direction. I think that's the big call for it. And the last point I'll say is that LUPED is the designated decarbonisation zone in Clare County Council's Climate Action Plan. In Limerick, it's our city centre and there are areas for trialling, testing, prototyping. Uh, so we are open to business to try and do it. We do need support from regulators for certain amounts of trialing and testing. But come and let's try it. You know, there's nothing wrong with failure on it. It's all about learning and building capacities. And you've got communities, from my experience, especially in the last five years, but throughout my entire career, is that communities are hungry to participate and they want to make a change. Uh, when we did our development plan in 2022, I aligned all the submissions to the SDGs. It's all about sustainable communities. They want to be sustainable. They want to be climate resilient. You know, I think we're pushing an open door if we do it right in the spirit of co-creation and working together. Great. Sorry? Sure, absolutely. So one of the things that I find very interesting as well, um, so for a lot of people, uh, the, it's, it's to do the circularities to do it the cost of waste and waste costing them and to be able to bring that into circularity and, and add value to it. And it's, to be successful on a very local level, um, that has to also have the sustainability aspect in the sense that it can go forward without funding. 
So I, I like to see these projects, you know, because we all know that this waste has value and ultimately that value is going to be realized by someone. So to have that value realized by the community in a sense that they are able to, now I know the, 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 I suppose, you know, when the, what's the word? Um, let's skip on from it, but the, the value of the, 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 the waste, if it can be brought into a business that can be the community can drive, then they have ownership of the waste, they have ownership of the, the business, and they, then the, the, obviously they're more concerned with that, that continuing. Sure, sorry. Just to hold you on that for a second, when we're talking waste, are we talking sort of just general municipals? Are we getting into food waste? Or Well, I suppose from, from our point of view, well, in Luped, we had this abundance of uh, slurry. And so from our farm, we, we, we grow our hemp regenerative. So we make a, our own um, kind of a, a natural fertilizer with microbes. But w what we saw with this project with this project is that we had all this slurry and the slurry was causing other issues down the line for for the community in the sex in the sense that it was being put into the land and that was running into the rivers and that was causing another knock-on effect so um so now we know that that slurry has value it can be put into an anaerobic digester and then it could become an organic fertilizer we also know now that we can grow hemp uh, regeneratively on farmers land not only a small amount of their land they'd only have to put a little bit of their land aside to grow hemp to turn that into biochar so then by adding the biochar which is a natural filter to this organic fertilizer that was produced within the community we were decarbonizing the farms not using artificial fertilizer and getting rid of the the downstream of um, issues with slurry runoff so you know we had the problem and we had the solution we just didn't have the funds to make the, the you know that into a, a, a well-run business, if you understand what I'm saying. Sure. So those were the wastes. They're 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 in it was, but because we were a rural decarbonizing zone, or waste is very different to an urban um, decarbonizing zone. But it's kind of again, it's how the the costs that are involved in collecting those wastes, even in a local setting, who manages that? How do we manage that waste? How do we ensure that it's you know it, there's a, no kind of um, environmental issues with how it's collected? Mm -hmm. But it's also doing it on a, a much, much shorter value chain. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm sorry, I was going chasing after some of my own research interests there when I went down that little uh, sidestep. Uh, I'm going to jump back to you, Patrick, because I, I know you referred to it in, in your slides um, and, and I suppose a wealth of um, examples. But um, maybe in particular, if you could expand a bit on the collaborative benefits or opportunities between institutions um, and private sector, SMEs, industry, and, and local agencies to drive on some of these agendas? Yeah, so the collaboration is absolutely essential and cooperation and co cooperative engagement. Um, the economy that we work within has got to a certain point by working in a certain way so we shouldn't expect that if we want to develop a circular economy or a bioeconomy, that by doing things the way we did them before, we will get to where we want to go. And if we're putting forward uh, pathways like circular economy and bioeconomy, energy transition as being renewable energy transition as being important means of getting to where we need to go to, then we need to think about how people are going to work together. And so. In our, for example, just to say how we're trying to create and shape this, we have opened two funding opportunities this year. One is through the EU Just Transition Fund. So we worked very closely with our colleagues in the Department of Environment and Climate and the Eastern and Midlands Regional Assembly. So what can be funded in there? The projects need to be co-led by SMEs who are going to be the engines of the uh, bioeconomy, uh, 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 local authorities, county councils, um, and uh, then uh, research performing organizations as, as the real uh, sort of leaders. Beyond that then, basically everyone in a bio-based value chain that needs to be there in a project to make it successful can be funded. Now, we had to go through extensive <laughs> examination of state aid funding rules to see how we could achieve this. And, and so, we know that collaboration and cooperation is absolutely essential. And we know that in funded activities, that it's 
all, all, also not the level of funding necessarily that everyone needs, but they need to be able, able to participate as an equal participant. So a key partner might only need to be funded to one or two percent of the overall budget, but they, as in either an innovation intermediary or as a knowledge base or knowing tacit knowledge on the ground, they're absolutely essential. So we have to be able to combine these people together. So that's what we've been trying to achieve, as Lalita was mentioning, as one of these hurdles that needed to be overcome. Because what we've seen to this point was only certain people can be funded and a lot of other people were left out and this left projects and, and partnerships suboptimal. So that's where we're trying to work towards. And um, I suppose in, in the end, what's needed in between them all, like a very important point was made this morning about the connection that people on this, in, in these chairs offer within the system. You know, they know there's a good, uh, person over there with really good knowledge and they're putting them in touch with someone else over here and they're unblocking the system by w getting people to work together in loop head. It's not so simple for farms with all the jobs they have to do every day to work together collectively within the community. That's not that easy. They, they want to get out, they want to do their job in the day, they want to get out with their kids in the evening to go to the local hurling match. They want to come home and they want to have a cup of tea. So you have, to, you have to aid them to work together. You have to aid them to work with SMEs that have unbelievable knowledge like Chalignus. You would not believe the amount of EU projects they're involved in. The respect that they have in Europe for unlocking problems within the bioeconomy. So this is, this is essential to be able to get people working together. Patrick, and, and I think you touched on something that we might hopefully get back to, is that be it the farmer who has to go about their, their daily business, but we look at circularity, within other industries that I suppose their traditional setup is to drive a process to make a product and maybe waste or heat or whatever other part of it was always just seen as part of the process um, and not maybe something to, to focus as much energy or resources on, whereas now it's almost like some, something of a, maybe a bit of a paradigm shift that energy, waste management, waste valorization and characterization and reuse potential and so on has come much more to the fore um, and companies might not be set up for that and it's people like ourselves or Sligness and others who can bring that expertise um, to the problem. Um, yes, yeah, so sorry Brian, um, again I suppose maybe at the, at the local level within Limerick but at the regional um, how can, how do you see what the like of ourselves and our neighbours as other, institution, other institutions can bring to these collaborative projects? Um, a huge amount. Uh, there's no question in my mind that uh, certainly in this region, the level of uh, institutional expertise th that's there between the, the universities and um, uh, private uh, companies and, and small and medium enterprises and communities is vast, I think, and I, I think quite a lot of us here can see, uh, you know, a potential, a huge potential, f if we can just connect the dots, uh, and the challenge is connecting the dots, I think. Um, it, it strikes me that, you know, while everybody here might have a strong sense of that potential, um, there, I'm hearing a frustration that, you know, things that are so obvious perhaps to some of the people in this room aren't happening. And, and I wonder about how, uh, you know, how we can go forward, how we can ease those frustrations and, and inject uh, optimism and energy into uh, the direction that, you know, we're trying to go. And it strikes me that the local authorities in Ireland are the, the conduits for a lot of policy that comes down from central government. And I wonder if uh, the local authorities should be uh, upskilled, I think, and, and perhaps uh, given a role and a responsibility to be the champions locally for the circular economy. Uh, and that w won't be easy because, uh, you, you know, as Patrick says, like this is a huge change in, in how our economy works. Uh, it's bigger than waste, right? It's uh, we talk about waste and we talk about circular economy a lot, but it's it's much broader than that. It's how we design things, how we reduce 
um, material use in uh, in production in the first place, and and there's so many other layers to it, and it's not something that in a local authority you can simply, you know, take a, a, a clerical officer or staff officer and make them the circularity champion and you know they start coordinating with institutions such as ul um and all the various stakeholders you need really good people um who are qualified and understand it and and get it and there is a precedent in recent years actually in the uh it's a a different area but um somewhat connected actually uh particularly with rural ireland is the town center's first policy Uh, Kieran would know an awful lot about this and what the government did when they brought about that policy was that they they started putting as well as providing funding to towns all across the country uh, they set out criteria about how they they felt towns should develop but they appointed uh, officers like qualified accredited uh people and they put them into the local authorities to do that coordination piece um and it's early days yet you know and that one kieran could certainly say more but it, it's it strikes me that you do need that circularity champion uh doing that coordinating uh, and and not just coordinating with the various stakeholders but and every region is different as well uh, that's that point has been well made uh, what the Midwest has in terms of uh, uh, circular economy potential could be far different to what a, another region has. Um, so it won't be one size fits all. Uh, and um, I think there's an argument for having that that kind of champion in place, perhaps at the local authority level. And it would be not just about the, the coordination, but I think uh, it would be about feeding uh, information back up to central government as well uh, so that policy can in turn be refined. I'm sorry, I just want to hold you while I have you there for a second, Brian, as well, just a follow on. That's, I sp- we're sitting here and, and so far today we've been talking about the institution as research. I suppose we're educators too. And do you see a role from us in at that level of in, in our programs, but maybe also in, say, outreach into community, sharing some of the knowledge that mightn't be, say, core research, but touches into issues that we haven't got into yet anyway, but maybe things like clean air, clean water, as we as we target our, our, our climate issues and environmental issues. Yeah, and at the risk of accusing academics of being in their ivory towers, uh, <laughs> um, there is something there where researchers toil away, um, you know, and do really good research and... and uh break new ground in in areas but you know <laughs> they go home to their families and their friends and those people have no idea what they're doing you know and certainly beyond that um the wider wider community mightn't know what that research is and i come out here uh, regularly as you know and i'm always blown away every time there's new information uh, and i realize that ul is at the the very forefront uh, of critical research and perhaps if, if more of us knew that uh, across the community, we would engage a little bit more uh, and lean on, uh, not just UL, I should say, it's, it's the other institutions as well. Um, so there is something, I think there's probably a responsibility on the research institutions to tell their story. Uh, that's, uh, you know, you're moving away from academics and into marketing there, but that is usually important. And uh, if the broader community don't understand what's happening, um you know they they might not feel how we can move forward how we can connect those dots i'm sorry brian but sometimes we might communicate it to the wider community but sometimes we don't even know what the person next door is doing and i suppose we have to work on that um just in the interest of time just want to drive on a bit as well in um I suppose maybe a bit more the i don't know if it's nitty gritty but for example uh Limerick council has recently brought out their the climate action plan um at the regional level i suppose are there specific challenges or opportunities um that you can see um in i suppose in each of your sectors coming forward um and how do we prioritize maybe what we're going to move into next in our specific sectors i'll go to you on that one kieran 
Yeah, not an easy one. Uh, I suppose within our climate action plan, again, it's written with the objective of reducing carbon emissions. So, you know, that's its, its primary focus. And perhaps it's a mistake within it, but I think for the first iteration, it is probably needed. So our targets are aimed at how we as local authority reduce our emissions from our, our heating, our energy, and our transport of our vehicles, then beginning to look at things like our grey fleet and how we actually do our business, and then empowering communities. So like our focus initially for the next two or three years is actually leading by example, trying to show actually uh, how we manage the resource of our building stock, how we heat it, how we manage our, our energy, and just as Brian said there, expertise in local government. Local authorities are now beginning to have energy engineers working in them. For the first time, we have one in Limerick as a result of initially a European project. And I think the knowledge and capacity that that's bringing and that's allowing us to talk to communities and evaluate their proposals for solar panels in their community centres and their battery storage is really, really positive. And again, it, it points to the idea of champions. Actually, local authorities are continually changing their functions. We've got biodiversity officers now. Every local authority is now going to have a biodiversity officer. You know, so understanding and, and leading the communities. If there is sectors, I suppose the big sector for Limerick City Centre would be areas around district heating and heat recovery, uh, rather than having to completely retrofit the entire historic building stock of the city centre, district heating would actually take a lot of that lifting out of it, but actually where are those sources of heat? Uh, what does that structure look like, it, not just in physical terms, but in terms of its governance? And back to some of the points Patrick made, like who, who owns this? Who's, who's going to manage these processes? And I think that it's things like that, that these questions are actually now being prompted, and we could have done with the answer. We need the answer today. But actually, the solutions are and the solutions that people are coming up with are our pathways are really coming thick and fast, and we need to speed up our responses from regulation and support to, to allow it to happen. But if you want me to pick one for Limerick City Centre, it is a district heating network. How that can be done? How can that be have a public value to it rather than as a complete commercialisation exercise where it's completely extracting? Because there's a that produces its own value to Ireland Inc. So we have a proposal at the minute that we're working with DG Reform on, on uh, financing the retrofitting wave where we're looking at a sustainable investment fund for Limerick City Centre to retrofit buildings. That requires a whole new different model of a business case model that takes in full life cycle cost assessment. And when I wrote the application, I didn't understand life cycle cost assessment. And I got a presentation in the last few months and uh, I grew my first grey hairs. But, uh, but we need to understand these things. We need new business models. We need ways of saying, actually, by doing that, you're supporting Ireland, Ireland Inc. Firstly, in its terms of its carbon obligations, carbon taxes that are coming down the line. But also, there's health benefits to that. And can those benefits be monetized up front as part of these processes that then allows them to be much more financially uh, support it at those points. So we need to continually, we need to, a change of mindset. So I'd love to see economists and something like that, uh, that in, in this room because I think they're a vital part to, to this, to supporting the research, to finding this new business model because climate action is going to require us to fundamentally change our business practices. Lalitha, I suppose not to give away too much maybe IP, but Patrick mentioned the numerous European projects you've been involved in and indeed national as well. Um, what are, can you share with us maybe on some of the regional challenges you see and how bioeconomy can be challenged in it or indeed open opportunities uh, at the regional level? Um, for this, I have to go back to what Laura has, you know, mentioned waste, you know, the value of waste, how we realize it. And unfortunately, um, the value of waste from Ireland is realized most of the time by the neighboring country. I'm sorry, you know. So that that's the fact. Yeah. And and this makes it challenging to estimate how much of this resource is available. What value should we put on it. 
because the whole business model is dependent on that. Like, uh, how is the supply chain currently? Because uh, quite a lot, lot of it goes for either compass facilities and rubic digestion. That's well and good. These are collection points, and you can work with them because once you extract the value, they can still go to these, you know, the compost and anaerobic digestion sector. But when we cannot estimate in the next five years, will this resource be available or not? That makes it extremely challenging to, to think of a commercial business model. And uh, policy plays a significant role here because it is, um, I'm trying to say how to put it, because the, the, at least from Seligness, what we are involved in is to extract the high value components and there is and there is still carbon left, there is all, you know, the good stuff left that can go for um, to local hubs to, to produce the, the fertilizers or to produce the compost, to produce biochar. It is th still the industries can work together but if the resource itself is a question, that is the major challenge. And I think that is where probably the, the policy or the local body or you know whatever, it should look at um, the supply chain and keeping that value within our country and locally as much as possible, not letting it go out to some other country or not letting it to go out to burn. I mean, in Patrick's presentation, there is a beautiful slide. Try everything, and if nothing works, it goes to incineration. And that's the approach we need to take. And the policy should support that sort of approach, not the other way around. So we have to really think hard and deep in, in this. And universities, SMEs, industries, we all should come together and, and speak about it because waste is value. It's no more waste. It's not waste anymore. So I really want that to happen, you know, from this. And am I complicating your answer if I say something like not all waste? It, I suppose waste is a generic term. Yep. And even if we get into organic wastes, they're so varied. And yes. Laura Jane, you spoke of the, I don't like calling it a waste now, but the byproduct of the hemp growing process and how that had value but again not to uh, <laughs> confuse it but you know if that was it maybe say a traditional silage bale and that leaked that that has much more maybe of an environmental footprint so I suppose at the regional level if we are to advance the bioeconomy roadmap um, have we got methods in place to look at our our waste generation I suppose in the first case waste minimization but then what wastes are we producing? How we valorize them is different. Maybe that's for the likes of yourselves can come in and indeed us too and, and, and others. Um, but Laura Jane, I suppose if, if we were advancing the bioeconomy roadmap in your specific region, would, I suppose, what are, are, there, are there pitfalls? What, what have you learned? How would you, would you do it differently? Yeah, the, what no, what I would look at is uh, the fact that the the waste, if we're going to use the word waste, has value, but it's also very very expensive to move <laughs> and to collect and to so about keeping that very very local. You know, that I suppose that and that there's value in the person who's producing the waste, um, making sure that it gets to that location because, you know, if it's going to cause a farmer undue effort and cost to bring his waste material to somewhere to be processed, that there has to be a benefit for that farmer to do that. And, and these materials that we're talking about are very lightweight. You know, you're talking about huge quantities that are very expensive to transport. So from an environmental point of view, you don't want to be bringing this to a central processing point in the center. So what from the Hemp for Soil project, what I really saw as a, you know, from and with what I'd love to see piloted is that these um, or small scale processing of this waste is done locally and that the value is, is given to the community and that they have the pride of what, what's the, the, I suppose, the enterprise that's driven from that. And I think that feeds into then the bigger, you know, you know that becomes regional and that becomes national. Okay, great, thanks. 
And and Patrick, you spoke of your drive down this morning and the different community bioeconomies that you you witnessed. Um, can you share maybe what you might see as some of the specific opportunities and challenges in the region? Yeah, so I, th I think a, a very good starting point to consider bioeconomy development is to look at already currently what is going on. So you can see in different parts of Ireland that uh, there may be a predominance of the dairy sector or there may, may be predominance of the beef sector or other agri-sectors or even around the coast. And you start from there and you see how you can integrate science, technology and innovation to help the current industries adapt. Um, in this thinking, then what you will see is uh, what we need to do is support emerging SMEs, for example, to bring in new solutions. What we need to do um, is maybe uh, also support primary producers to look at diversification opportunities, but how they can take those diversification opportunities and build maybe new types of cooperation or cooperative approaches. So they're becoming part of a value chain or they're becoming part of a business. So they just, just don't become a biomass supplier, you know, old school, old style. You produce this at the lowest cost. You're at the uh, the mercy of the market and uh, the, there, there, there is a businesses processing and making value. Maybe we need to think about this. What we need to start with is what are we doing locally currently? How can we best adapt that to fit into environment and climate profiles? What are the economic opportunities can uh, uh, be taken from, from, from what we're already doing? And then look at maybe new emerging opportunities that are best suited to the types of soil, to the type of land, to the interests of people. Because you can't tell people what to do. You have to sort of offer them opportunities and then it's up to them to pick them uh, to pick the ones that they think are the best, aid them to work with the right people and support them to bring this to fruition. So that just takes a little bit probably more sophistication in the system than we currently have. And um, But that's again a message that we have to bring through uh, from the local level through to the, the central governance level. And, and I think you can see it emerging. You can see it emerging in CAP under EIP Agri that allowed a lot of local bottom-up opportunities, a lot of bottom-up thinking to, to emerge and align. Uh, but we probably need to think about how you can go from an EIP project to it actually being integrated into an economic uh, and social opportunity. There's still some gaps there. And I think that's where thinking needs to go again to, to progress this. And on the thinking, that's, again, something we can bring to the conversation, maybe in co-design, co-creation, to get that governance working at, at a, a ground level. Um, Brian, uh, on that, challenges and opportunities in the region and how a bioeconomy bio roadmap might address that? Yeah. Uh, uh, I have a question, I suppose. Is there no such thing as a, a regional Are there specific roadmap? ones that you can see and, um, I suppose, challenges for implementation? and But I suppose not just to focus on challenges, but opportunities with implementing a, you know, a new biomass plant for energy um, or what, whatever the scenario might be. Yeah. But, like, what, what opportunities can you see that bring into the region as, if we take that paradigm shift and how we might have moved from business as usual into a more bioeconomy focused way of doing things. Yeah, um, I suppose uh, I'm not an expert uh, and um, I have some high level thoughts, I suppose. Um, it would seem to me that in this region, uh, uh, certainly the agricultural, like, you know, there's a large dairy uh, sector here and there's a significant uh waste if i can use that word or byproduct uh, from it um there is an ambition at the high level to really scale up anaerobic digestion uh you know across the country i think it's um to have 200 ad plants by 2030 i think and um that that's huge you know in terms of a ramping up of uh what we're trying to do um and obviously the the outcome then is that you know you'll have uh, 
methane, biomethane being produced uh, at a significant enough level, and you can inject that into the national grid then, and it's carbon neutral, and so you're decarbonizing your your gas system then, and you're also providing a revenue stream for farmers, uh, not just a revenue stream, but actually uh, somewhere f to put their byproduct, you know? So it seems to me that that's uh, an obvious one. Uh, for this part of the country. Um, I'd like to think that that is being mapped out. <laughs> to, I just don't know um, for sure. Um, because 2030 is only around the corner and there's actually a 2025 target as well. Um, so uh, I'd like to see some progress there. Um, I think the, the on the energy piece, and actually Kieran mentioned the district heating, that's really exciting, you know, that that we have an ambitious district heating uh, uh, challenge uh, for the whole country, uh, but we're starting from s scratch, you know, unlike other countries, and we don't have a tradition of uh, high density living, and you have to have high density, really high density, to really make it work. Um, so there's a whole planning piece then, there's, there's the challenge around how you uh, develop the networks, like you're talking about fairly sizable pipes going into the buried in the ground you know and what what state level authority or would it be the local authority builds these networks and owns them and manages them uh, there's a huge challenge there but uh, an opportunity uh, in like in limerick that we have a number of industries that are generating a, lo a lot of waste heat and uh, i think it was remiss actually that you know the city is expanding out towards Mongert and it's a lot of really low density development uh, and you have the cement factory right there and you know that's going to be incinerating a lot of waste um, and it's going to be generating uh, a lot of heat and that heat could be used I don't think the opportunity is lost by the way I think it'll it'll come back into play as developers and authorities realize you know which way their things are going uh, and of course, with density, if you get density right, you, you can support transport as well, you know, and public transport in a, a really effective way. Um, so we're, we're probably going in the right direction, but uh, I think the system, all elements of the system don't understand, uh, you know, where we're trying to go and how, you know, the detail of it and the principles, I suppose, that are uh, underpinning the direction that we're trying to go. Uh, in the Midwest as well, of course, the... Uh, this vast, vast opportunity to generate uh, clean energy off our coast and to bring that ashore and then to use that to power our own country but uh, send excess power off to Europe is a huge opportunity. Uh, there's an opportunity to develop uh, uh, clean and synthetic aviation fuel with that electricity uh, and helping the global aviation sector to uh, to decarbonize in the decades ahead using Irish clean energy. You know, it's hugely exciting. And I would imagine that UL, <coughs> excuse me, will be the very, very center of all of that. And, and it needs to be, and I don't think it'll happen without the expertise that's, that's in UL. So it just, at a high level, it strikes me that there's incredible opportunity for this part of Ireland and, and this part of Europe. Um, and the challenge is understanding that opportunity and then figuring out how to realize it. Thanks very much. That, that's, I suppose, you've, it's a very um, great potential there and um, opportunity, you say, for, for um, a bright and green future. Um, but going back, I think what came up in so many conversations in there, I think an important part of that is engagement and listening, which I'm, I'm sure you're doing. It, it'd be, I suppose, remiss of me as well as an environmental scientist not to ask my, my next question because I suppose a lot of the conversation, I'm not saying it's just what the bioeconomy is, but to say there's a lot of talk of things like biomass crops uh, and land use. And I suppose this is thrown out a question rather than going to anyone specifically first, but is land use for whatever our, you know, with economy in the sector, the, the economy in the question, um, because often the focus is climate change, and that's absolutely under, understandable. But sometimes what we often miss is the, the double side of that, which is things like biodiversity decline, 
water quality decline. And I suppose as we move into a much more active bio economy, circular economy, lifestyle way of doing business, is there is there scope that we can do both, that we can enhance and protect the natural environment, but yet use the land to, or the sea, or the rivers to produce whatever it is we, we're, we're, we're going to go for. You have the microphone still up yeah, there, Brian, so I, I'll let you continue, maybe. I'm really interested in this one. Um, th th to some degree, the, the, the challenge of restoration of biodiversity loss and addressing climate change are aligned, and to, in another way, they're not aligned. They pull against each other. Um, you could, if your focus was just to address carbon emissions uh, and you know you'd you'd build or so you'd plant vast plantations of sitka forests and um they wouldn't be the best for biodiversity you know so there's trade-offs there's very significant trade-offs sometimes and on the land use piece um we do have to be careful that you know in pursuing a circular economy that we get it right because if you get it even slightly wrong your th the consequence could be degraded rivers and uh, because you know you're you're just throwing a lot of fertilizer onto land to grow ener energy crops and so on so we have to be really careful that um we we get this right uh, and we don't say this this particular part of of, of policy is the magic bullet and we're going to go all in on this because if we do there's going to be knock-on con consequences that are quite serious, I think. Okay, great. And as you were holding on to your microphone, I saw Patrick reaching for his. So, Patrick, uh, you go next. Yeah, well, I think this is a really important message. Like, So, we know we have a bioeconomy as it exists, and it has, uh, it's largely made up, up, up of the agri-food sector. So, it has emissions challenges. It has... Uh, um, I suppose, in, uh, environmental challenges, water quality challenges, etc. So the idea is, is that you think about how you need to do this sustainably with circularity. And we have seen from, say, projects that have been funded, for example, Science Foundation Ireland have fu funded a Farm Zero C project working with the Carberry Dairy Processor in Cork and a, a range of scientists from the Bioric National Bioeconomy Research Centre. So when they asked themselves on a, a, an intensive dairy farm, how do we produce a, a biomass sustainably? So essentially they started looking at uh, reducing off emissions intensity but then they also quickly realized that you need to go beyond that then to integrating biodiversity into the farm, to looking at uh, sources of, uh, I suppose, in inputs that are coming into the farm and how they need to be either locally sustainably produced or even reducing imports of feed to mo more locally uh, sourced uh, uh, sources of feed. So if you f philosophically ask yourself the question, how do you sustainably look uh, produce biomass, then you start looking for solutions. So you're on an innovation journey that you're never really going to stop. It leads you then to looking at things like uh, carbon farming. So again, you see the evolution and the diversification of farming. Beyond that then, when you produce the biomass and you bring it to the processing, you start looking at the sustainability and the circularity of those processes and you start realizing that when you're processing milk that you can do it in a zero waste manner to produce a whole range of products that can go back into the economy that actually start to help to solve the challenge of having a uh, carbon neutral and biodiversity rich uh, farmland so it's a virtuous cycle that we need to get onto there will be challenges and there will be problems. I'm not saying it's a silver bullet. It's going to be a, a collective a integration of knowledge and science and thinking that will eventually get us to the point of, but there's challenges getting there because we need to scale that up. It challenges the way we currently do things, the way we structure, the way we work together. So we're on a journey here. But the first thing is we all have to accept the challenge and then we have to start looking for the solutions. And when we're looking for the solutions, we return to the bioeconomy, we return to the circular economy, we, work, we return to nature-based solutions to become part of what we do. So this, this, is, this is the journey we're on, but it's not without a uh, requirement for a lot of thinking and a lot of analysis 
uh, and a lot of explaining and awareness raising. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, Lalitha, would you like to come in there? Um, I just want to say that Patrick has mentioned Carberry. I always used to say Ireland has the first biorefinery. I studied Carberry fermentation when I was in Masters back in India. And um, maybe I, you know, in Ireland, you do not know that, but in Ma we studied Carberry fermentation because it was one of a kind lactose fermentation to ethanol using the waste stream. It's highly innovative. When I came to Ireland first, when I met Ender Buckley from Carberry, from Carberry I called my master's friends and went like, I met someone from Carberry, you know that, you know? And, and there is a lot of innovation happening in Ireland from decades. And um, that's true, bioeconomy is, is, is really part of Ireland, like the way Ireland operates. It is just when we want to move from like, so we have established a, a type of bioeconomy and it's running very good, it's perfect. Now we just have to stay, take that one step further um, because I think almost every, every SME, every large industry in Ireland, every farmer, if, if not every, almost everyone, is inclined towards nature-based solutions, biodiversity, to want to do good for the environment. So what's needed is having this type of conversations more often and with larger group, and definitely we can do that because there is huge potential. If, we, if, if Ireland could do it when no one did it, why can't we do it now? So it is very much possible, so. That's great, and thanks again. It's it's another, I think, following on from not seeing you're the only ones who've done, but Brian had a very positive message there a few moments ago, and again, that's very positive. And it's a great way as we get near the end of our panel discussion to hear so much positivity. Um, and Laura Jane, in the in the project, um, you referred to again on Loop Head, you talked about soil health and so on. Um, did you see you know plenty of biodiversity or room for biodiversity, and was that something that stakeholders were happy to engage with? Uh, yeah, so I, I, I can start from where my thinking in this question is, is coming from. It's again about um, land ownership and the land, the stakeholders in the land and, and how they get to benefit from the same opportunities that maybe a, a company might benefit from. So when we approached the Hemp for Soil project, um, we, we had had advice before when we started Hemp, uh, Wild Atlantic Hemp, we had had learnings from the miscanthus crop that had been planted and what a lot of farmers who told us about miscanthus they said that you know they put it in the ground that was the land was then for miscanthus it was never to be used for anything else again and so then when they had to take that out that was a very expensive you know um change of use so for the hemp for soil project what we did was we worked with the farmers we said we don't want to take change your business model we went with the, the point of like, we're not, we're, we're offering you solutions. We're not going to try and change what you're doing. So we said, you know, hemp is a crop that grows and it sequesters a huge amount of carbon. It's also a phytoremedial, which means it cleans the soil. It's been used in places that like um, for tailings around mines for cleaning soil. But it's also, uh, and it also produces protein and it's a carbon crop. But it also, it's very, very attractive to, to the biodiversity. So what we were saying, to, and it, the, the, the beauty of it is it only takes three months to grow. So it grows to the, the height of a small tree um, in three months. So farmers, what they're able to do is maybe put a small bit of their land aside and say, this year we'll grow hemp in this plot. And it does all those things for that plot and actually increases the productivity of the land the year after. They've, they've sequestered carbon. They've created this protein. They've attracted biodiversity. And... Um, but at the same time, and, and if they can benefit from carbon, the carbon from the plant they're growing, you know, at the end of the three months once it's harvest, that land is back to them again and they can use it for whatever they're going to use it again. So I suppose it's a case of we can provide solutions that do lots and lots of things without shifting land ownership away from people or from without um, affecting their business models or what they've done culturally for, for a very long time. So that's, yeah, I suppose that's how I would, that's how Hemp Soil approach that. Thanks. And uh, Kieran, you've already mentioned biodiversity officers in 
local authorities. So as Limerick City embarks on its decarbonisation of a city and all the other initiatives that you've mentioned to everyone this morning or in conversations with you earlier, um, I suppose, can you share how does the wider environmental health, environmental quality and issues like biodiversity get encompassed into a bioeconomy map? Uh, God. <laughs> We have to do this, right? We're in a climate emergency. And the worst thing we can do is do nothing and keep business as, as usual going. And as Brian says, we have, we gotta be really careful of unintended consequences, but we gotta try, we gotta test. People in this room who are researching have got to continue to help us in local government and actually out in the world, uh, help us to, to enable people and support people across it. Our biodiversity plan, we're starting off from a base of one person trying to envision the biodiversity of an area the size of County Limerick and prepare, produce a strategy in and around it. And it's not just, and it, that also has to now include bioeconomy. It's a massive area. So we're gonna, I think we have to take it one step at a time. We gotta be, don't promise, don't over promise and under deliver, we just gotta do, start off with the basics, build it up from that, support the initiatives that are going on. Loads of people are already doing things like this, like Laura's doing up in, up in Loop Head, you know? We gotta be there to support, you know, encourage, advocate for this sort of approaches. Uh, you know, bring Laura down to the farmers in, in Ballyhara and say, in the Golden Vale and say, this is one option that you have to have. But, we got to open up our ears and, and to listen. Farmers are good custodians of the land. They want to do the best thing. Everybody wants to do the best thing. All they want to do is, is be given a bit of knowledge and be empowered to bring about the changes. You know, we want to have a world we can hand over to our children, to the next generation, and to be sustainable. And pointing fingers of blame, I think, is not the way we do it. We do it in the spirit of cooperation. And I come back to your, your quintuple helix that you put up at the end and, and the wraparound of that is, is our environment and our, our, bio, our biodiversity and, our, and everything that involves. That's what we've got to protect. And if we want to have the person in the middle, you know, it's about the two. And I think that's, that's much more, 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 more of the challenge than really trying to, me trying to say what's going to be contained or what's our direction of our biodiversity plan. I think we're, we're iterating. We're going to see what we can do, learn from what we gather the information, gather get their baselines right, understand how things are operating. It's a whole new area. We're talking about new skills needed for local government and across the whole, it's just new skills needed across everywhere. And empowering ourselves and allowing ourselves to understand it. You know, I think it's a great step for us as local authorities to, to now beginning to move into the sphere. Like we have scientists, we've got a noise action plan. We're going to launch uh, an air quality monitoring campaign with EPA over the course of, of the summer with three or 4,000 people collecting air quality data. You know, positive things, but we, that's helping us to understand how Limerick is, is behaving, uh, just as a microcosm for, for the rest of Ireland. And I think that's the role that local government will do. It's collating that, bringing it together, and using that, and giving that to anyone who wants to use it for the benefit of society is, is, is my role I, I see as, as coordinator of, of the climate action initiatives, as well as trying to small scale projects like that, but it's about supporting and enabling people much more than standing up and doing other things, you know? Well, thanks, Karen. I think what you referred to there as well, maybe as an example of how those initiatives can come on, because you just, I, Limerick is doing the air quality with the EPA this summer, you said, and, and I know that's something that they rolled out in, in Dublin first and then Cork and then Galway, but it's citizen science, it's people, it's one of those things from talking to the EPA, when people actually see the data is their house or their street or their school, they're more, I suppose, ownership of it and activity around it rather than it's a figure in a textbook or on a computer screen and they're not relating it back to maybe their own health or their, or their children's health. Incredible. Like we have another project on at the minute with SCAI uh, called Smart Labs about we've put environmental sensors into 70 buildings across the city centre together with energy monitors. And these sensors 
are measuring heat, humidity, air quality. And we thought actually, we'd, and we we're going to use that data to drive reductions or more responsible energy use within the buildings. But actually people are coming back with their internal air quality as being, being concerns and the health. And that's the way in. So that's the next stage for, for that. So I was an energy project actually because it can have an unintended consequence and a positive one to actually people want to understand the health of the building. So how, how do we promote healthy buildings and back to timber and back to everything else about, about how you do But citizen science, you know, it, it will allow you to, a, to, uh, to explore an area on a much wider basis, but actually you'll understand people's needs and wants. And that's what we got to always respond to people's needs and wants. Absolutely. And I suppose needs and wants. Patrick, you started off this morning with, I suppose, the call to arms for the region. And we've heard, thank you, everyone, from, from the panel here with um, uh, stakeholders representing so many different sectors of the bioeconomy and how we might drive it forward. And I've been asking questions here for the last while. What I want to do is we just head to the end of the time is throw it out to the, the floor and see if, do we have a mic? But if we have any questions maybe from people in the audience uh, for our panel. So thank you for the interesting discussion. Um, it's always interesting to realize how much more is going on uh, than it, it happens in your own circle. So we are going to establish a living lab uh, in Ireland. It's part of uh, an Interreg project. So there are five regions in Europe where we establish living labs around uh, using recycling fertilizers, so bio-based uh, circular economy fertilizers. So it will be really interesting uh, to pick your brain with, uh, with what you have established already. Uh, and so I'm coordinating that uh, for the Interreg projects called Renew to Cycle. So uh, and we're going to establish that uh, later this year. So uh, um, so if, if you get an invite from me, <laughs> my name is Aham Schmalenberger, um, an email or so, then don't just click it away. So I would really like to have you uh, in this establishment of Living Lab, uh, getting part of that as a stakeholder. So we are focusing on, on, on uh, tillage farmers, uh, in Ireland and, as I said, four more regions in, in Europe. Uh, and what we want to have is materials that we have in part tested uh, in previous projects and have them as a demonstration uh, with tillage farming integrated. So I think JJ Lee is going to be also uh, talking later about uh, uh, hydrochar. So that is also one aspect we have used uh, uh, ashes and struvites in the past. And so, so these are parts of the components that we want to bring together. Okay, thank th you. Sorry, th th thanks, Akim. Uh, Morris, as well, I think you had a question there. Just a question for Patrick. Um, Patrick, um, what do you see as the, as the biggest barriers to our, for our transition towards a circular bioeconomy in, in the European context? The uh, European Commission just published a communication on biotechnology and bio manufacturing within the last month or so. And within that, there's eight areas identified, uh, and a lot of them are quite a high focus on, uh, first, of all, first of all, awareness raising. So there's not that much awareness, or there's not enough awareness uh, in the political system, across ministries, in industry, at, at all levels of governance about this opportunity. There is absolutely, there's probably over 2 billion euro being invested by the European Commission over a period of 10 years through Horizon Europe. So there's a huge sphere of knowledge available. This communication from the Commission recognizes that there needs to be a whole range of steps taken to, uh, I suppose, create and shape a market for bio-based products. And I think that's the most significant challenge. And that goes from uh, green public procurement systems, uh, being aware of uh, uh, bio-based products and their availability. Um, it goes to industry and enterprise systems, um, having the sophisticated instruments in enterprise policy, like clustering and networking, like how to scale up going from uh, knowledge and research to appropriately scaled biorefineries that develop value chains with all range of stakeholders that uh, uh, address environment and climate and economic opportunities. 
Um, and then beyond that, then uh, really the knowledge, I suppose, the barrier to understand that the role that uh, bio-based products play in the net zero transition. To date, it's not really that well understood. We're not saying that bio-based products are going to completely displace fossil fuel or energy intensive products. But what we're going to have to do is adjust production and consumption so that bio-based products play a sustainable role within this system. I think it has been mentioned here this morning that the world is changing, but it's probably not known by that many exactly what this change is going to encompass. But what we need to do then, I and mean, this is one of the biggest barriers, is to develop the system to bring people along with us because there's a risk that you leave people behind. There can be winners, there can be losers, or there just can be people who don't accept that things are changing. So there's a whole communication uh, piece needed around this. So that, that's what I would identify at this moment. I'm sure there's many other points that could be raised. Thanks, Morris. It's interesting to hear communication again. Um, I think, Luke, had you your hand up? Yeah, so sorry, up the back there. I've been listening uh, to the discussion that is going on, and I hear a lot of emphasis for uh, local and regional initiatives. Um, I think we see good representation of a few of the uh, industries regionally that work already with, uh, with the University of Limerick, so that's, uh, that's all great. But what I did not really hear, at least not emphasized, is the uh, the larger national scale challenges that uh, that we see. Um, uh, EU refuel is kicking in next year. There has been no provision for sustainable aviation fuels. There's still a discussion going on, and it requires a significant resource base for an industry that brings uh, four billion euros into the uh, Irish economy. I did not hear the role of. Um, um, Next steps in, um, in farming, the current farming is, uh, is, is sort of capped by the emission level of, uh, of the herd, whereas the route to market of uh, the current uh, 12 billion euros of um, Irish food exports is already there. You know? So where is the prioritization, prioritization, that's the proper word, um, of, the, of the national policies? And we have three representatives of the national um, scheme and I hear also from your side an emphasis of uh, of the region. That's fine. I, I think that's that's something that needs to happen. But how do we prioritize also the the larger opportunities? And from the University of Limerick perspective, Banal Institute is, I think, uh, ideally positioned to be a global player. So our competition is uh, MIT and Imperial College, and not the region um, itself. So our researchers need to focus on on that sort of thing. So. Also there, how from the national level do you prioritize the national level, the European and the global challenges, while still not ignoring what, what can be done locally? Okay, thanks Luke. I don't want to speak for the panel members just yet because they're far more versed than me in their own areas, but I do want to start off in an answer to that question with the remiss of this morning's uh, invitation and panel was to address the regional and, and localised need first and foremost. We ultimately can fit into a more national or indeed European call, but when I first spoke with Patrick and, and the other members, it was to really see how us as an institution sitting in a region can take on um, in working with our stakeholders to address those needs. Um, but feel free to agree or disagree with that comment, guys. Okay, will I have a go at this? Hi, Luke, how are you? Um, um, I'll just go back to a point I made early on about my work in the Joint Directors Committee, um, which is a committee of nearly every political party is represented and independent uh, politicians and um, TDs and senators as well. And we have these really good conversations. You know, we're lay people. I, I'm an engineer, which makes me unusual in, in Irish politics. Um, I, I heard lately that um, to not be an engineer in Chinese politics makes one unusual. It's or the exact opposite. But it, the point I'm getting to is, in answer to your question, is I suppose that the nature of our system, the nature of our democracy, I think it served us quite well. 
but one of the perhaps uh, I, I shouldn't say weak points um but one of the characteristics of our system and our democracy is we're, we're not autocratic we can't apply what seems to be the right idea um universally because somebody at the top thinks that it's the right idea um and i think that approach has probably served as well but the, the flip side of it is that we kind of stumble forward you know and and we make mistakes and we get things wrong and um i i i wouldn't advocate for change in the system that we have at all um you know but i think we have to recognize it's uh it's weaker points as well in in tackling the, the huge challenges and also in realizing the huge opportunities that we have. Um, Patrick, were you going to jump in there as well? So I, I think it's it's a really good question, uh, Luke. And um, so first of all, our, our remit was to, to examine from the regional perspective. But if you look at our National Bioeconomy Action Plan, what's really clear is, is that we have a focus on bioeconomy at community regions and cities level an interest in developing that approach we also look at it from a shared island approach so how can Nor Or northern ireland and ireland work together on the bioeconomy because as lilicia says resources pass uh, between the two jurisdictions we also work at a european level so um uh, the department of environment and climate and and minister of state ocean smith signed a, a, a Netherlands statement last week that was put to the Commission to ask them to focus in their new work programme on a, an overview of renewable and sustainable carbon for Europe. And that's coming from both uh, the circular economy, from the bioeconomy and from new technologies, going into a, a whole range of sectors that need to be either defossilised or decarbonised. Um, we're also looking at how the, uh, the bioeconomy from a national perspective and a European perspective can be transformative for the agri-food sector, which needs to remove out uh, certain inputs that are not sustainable, but also needs to be, uh, in, from a food a security perspective, ensure that we're pr pr uh, developing proteins, nutrients, starches, fibres, etc., and what we see from the Irish system is that, you know, with the, with the research and the knowledge base we're developing, an alignment of the likes of the, the dairy sector and the meat sector with the plant sector, the crop sector. So there needs to be an alignment between these systems that we haven't seen before. And you'll see a lot of targets set for land use in terms of uh, planting trees, land use in terms of growing crops and aligning and trying to reshape and, and re uh, view that figure. But that's with a view to uh, an EU and a global perspective. So I think probably wasn't just in the conversation this morning because of our remit, but it's, it is in the picture of what we're trying to do. And then again, to come into conversations that we have with you, there's the potential of looking at the alignment of the renewable energy sector with the diversification of the agri-food sector and the development of not just only food, but also food and bio-based products. And this is an, an international and global opportunity for Ireland. And that's why like investments like the investment in the National Bioeconomy Research Centre is going to underpin the economy. We don't understand it now, but in 20 years and 30 years time, we're going to understand that Ireland went in a direction that was revolutionary, that it comes to what the point of the, the debate was this morning. So thank you, thank Patrick, you. for that. Um, in fact, I like the way you ended that so much that I think we'll stop it there because I suppose just to, uh, as, we, as we end and time's against us, um, the ambition and uh, I suppose vision for starting today's or this morning's conversation uh, and, and, and talks uh, and what follows on was to, I suppose, do that as, as we look at this revolution that we need to decarbonize the economy, to um, drive and implement a bioeconomy footprint, to listen and engage with stakeholders to what's needed um, and what we at University of Limerick can do to enable, to facilitate, to co-design. Um, so I suppose while we're ending this panel discussion now and there is more of the morning to come, I just want to say as well to, to the audience um, and indeed our guests that hopefully this is just the first conversation and it's something that we will revisit 
again and um, again showcase maybe to you again on, in what we're doing in this area and hear from you as well and, and indeed other stakeholders how we're embarking and progressing um, this exciting and positive and opportunistic maybe um, paradigm shift in making society, the environment, the land a better place for us and the next generation. So I just want to wrap up and thank our panel for their contribution to this morning's conversation. Um, so sorry, yeah, please do join with me in thanking our panel.